just need to start again. Yeah. Come up here at the beginning of the service. All right, let's go to the camera, David. All right, let's go ahead and let's try this again. I apologize about the technical difficulties. Everything looked like it should be working on our end. Uh, so I don't know if it's a Facebook issue. We will try this one more time here this morning. We're going to begin singing here uh, by song number 329. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Isn't it a joy to have all this technology? Uh, it's just an incredible thing, and I'm thankful that we do. However, there's nothing 100% reliable besides the Word of God, is it? But I'm thankful that we get to re read this or sing this morning, and let's try singing this once again. I know that my Redeemer liveth. Song number 329. Let's sing one more song. My faith is real. I'm thankful that we can gather together, so to speak, and I pray that this is a little better. Again, I apologize for that, and uh, we're hopefully back on and back re and ready to go again. And so thank you for letting us know. We appreciate that very much, but we look forward to gathering together once again. That'll be a wonderful blessing for sure, and I pray that uh, this, time, this morning will be an encouragement to you. We're able, of course, to worship together as a church uh, for a wonderful reason, and that is because uh, we have been working with the council, and as we've been working with the council, they have uh, stated and agreed with us that just my family and I coming, that it would be perfectly fine for us to be able to live stream here from these facilities, and I'm thankful that we can do so. It feels more like church uh, doing that, and I'm thankful that we get to do that this morning, and I pray it's an encouragement and help to you. Thank you so much uh, for being patient with us. And I'm excited to see what God is going to do this morning. As we go to the Lord in prayer and open the service, I pray that uh, you would pray for a couple, for, uh, for, for a few requests. Excuse me. First of all, would you pray for a lady named Emma who is suffering with COVID-19? Uh, please remember her in prayer as well as her son Jaden. Uh, both are not well. Do remember them in prayer. And then also, let's do pray for those uh, loved ones, friends, neighbors that are not saved, that we've been witnessing through, the, through this time, I pray that God will use this means and others to help people uh, yeah, hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so please uh, pray and let's work together, uh, yay, through prayer and of course through the online medias that God gives us to be able to reach people with the gospel of Christ. 
Let's pray and ask God to bless the service this morning. Father, thank you so much for today. Thank you so much for the privilege that we have uh, to gather together, so to speak. And God, I know that we are not physically gathering together, but God, as we do so, gay through social media and through these live streams, and of course, work to uh, uh, see and to hear the truth of the Word of God, I pray that you would bless that. God, I pray that you would be with those requests that we have mentioned this morning. Think of Emma and Jaden this morning and others that we may be aware of that are uh, not well. I pray that you would strengthen them, help them, I pray. God, I do pray that you would be with those that we've been witnessing to and trying to get the gospel. God, I pray that they will come to know Christ as Savior this morning. God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you for being good to us. Please, I pray, bless this service. Pray that you would be with other gospel preaching churches across this world. And may many souls come to know Christ as Savior through this time. We love you. Thank you so much for loving us. Bless, please, I pray, everything that is said and done for your glory and for your honor. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Wonderful. Let's go ahead and take our Bibles this morning and read a portion of Scripture. Psalms chapter 115. Psalms 115. And we've been reading, of course, through the book of Psalms. We'll continue to do so once again this morning. Psalm 115. And let's look at verse number 1. The Bible teaches us, Not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but unto thy name give glory for thy mercy and for thy true sake. Wherefore should the heathen say, Where is now their God? But our God is in the heavens. He hath done whatsoever he hath pleased. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of men's hands. They have mouths, but they speak not. Eyes have they, but they see not. They have ears, but they hear not. Noses have they, but they smell not. They have hands, but they handle not. Feet have they, but they walk not. Neither speak they through their throat. They that make them are like unto them, so is every one that trusteth in them. O Israel, trust thou in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. O house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. Ye that fear the Lord, trust in the Lord. He is their help and their shield. The Lord hath been mindful of us. He will bless us. He will bless the house of Israel. He will bless the house of Aaron. He will bless them that fear the Lord, both small and great. The Lord shall increase you more and more, you and your children. Ye are blessed of the Lord, which made heaven and earth. The heaven, even the heavens, are the Lord's, but the earth hath he given to the children of men. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. But we will bless the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. Praise the Lord. Let's continue singing this morning, Victory in Jesus, song number 353.
Hey Amen. I love that song. Let's sing one more. 349. This is a favorite here at SBC. Uh, let's sing Complete in Thee. Amen. That was incredible songs. I'm thankful that we got to sing those this morning. We're going to get right into scripture this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And I'm thankful that we've had the privilege of being able to go through uh, this wonderful book, a book of instruction, a book of teaching, correction, a book of yea, helping the children of God to be able to get to where we ought to be spiritually speaking. And we're going to continue looking at this tremendous portion of Scripture this morning. 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and uh, we're going to read uh, this morning, starting in verse number 9, and we'll read through verse number 13 this morning. Notice what the Bible says. But take heed lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block to them that are weak. If, for if any man see thee which hast knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols? And through thy knowledge shall thy weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. I want to speak this morning, the third installment, if we could put it that way, on a thought of others in mind. Others in mind. Let's focus on others this morning as we think about what God teaches us through His Word. 
Father, I thank you once again for this morning. Thank you so much for the privilege we have to, yea, to gather together under the Word of God. And God, as we, yea, hear God's Word, I pray that you would use it. God, if there's one that is not saved, I pray that they will see the fallacy of the idol of their own beliefs that's apart from you, and they will put their trust in the true living God this morning. And we'll thank you and praise you for those that have trusted in Christ. God, all glory belongs to you. And I pray that you would help us this morning to lift up the name of Christ, high and exalted, in Jesus' precious name. Amen. If you go to an orchard and you look at some saplings and some young trees that are growing, you're going to see a commonality of how the fruit trees grow. Some grow very quickly and very strong. And as they grow strong, they are able to produce fruit. And as they are producing fruit, the strength by which they have grown, maybe they don't produce as much fruit as some others, but because they are strong and because they have grown deep in their roots, they are able to bear more fruit. They're able to carry more apples on their branches. They're able to be able uh, to withstand the wind and the elements and the storms. And they're able to do those things because they are strong. There are other trees, young trees, that likewise bear fruit. But they have not strengthened in the trunk or in the roots. The branches are not very strong. And they bear fruit maybe very quickly. Maybe even quicker than they should. And as they bear much fruit, the weight of the fruit that is on the limbs and the weight of the fruit that is even upon the trunk of that tree can be so strong at times that that, that, that that tree will experience limbs being broken or even that tree beginning to fall over and even break and even be destroyed because of the weight of the fruit. Are they both still fruit trees? Absolutely. But one is stronger and one is weaker. A wise farmer, a wise husbandman of an orchard will see that weak tree and begin to support it, put supports under its branches, put support upon its very trunk. Why? Because they don't want it to break. They don't want it to fail. They don't want it to perish. These are two trees, both bearing fruit. One is strong, one is weak. In 1 Corinthians chapter 8, we see a portion of Scripture where Paul deals with a, uh, with a myriad of subjects that entitle one basic question, but he approaches it from an aspect in which most people would not have thought he would have approached it from. He approaches it from the aspect of what you thought you knew, <laughs> you don't really know as much as you thought. He begins, first of all, by doing what? By guiding the mind, or by guiding the heart. He begins by teaching us what our hearts need to understand and how our hearts need to be guided. So as he guides that heart, he says, look, don't put your trust, don't put your whole being upon what your heart is speaking into what you think you know. For you think I, you know the answer I'm going to give, but I'm coming at you with a different answer. I'm coming at you with a higher response, and that is the response of love. He comes at them not from the knowledge standpoint, but from the basis of charity. God or Paul begins to guide the church in their heart. That the basis of 1 Corinthians 8 is about love. Loving thy neighbor as thyself. Secondly, he guides the mind. As we looked at last week, he acknowledges the truth. He acknowledges the truth that there are some who believe in idols. They are deceived and they believe in idols and how sad that is. 
And yet that is the truth this morning, that there are people who follow idols. Not only is the truth of those who follow idols, but there is the truth that there is one true living God. And no, no one can change that truth. No one can battle against that truth. Oh, we, people can say what they want, but the truth still stands. God is still the true and living God. And I'm thankful for that. I'm thankful that no man, no matter how powerful he is on this earth, cannot change that truth that God is God. He is everlasting God. And the Bible teaches us that uh, Saul, Saul began to not only acknowledge the truth, but acknowledge their belief as he was trying to help them understand what the principle of 1 Corinthians 8 comes from, guiding the heart of whether or not they should eat meat that was offered to idols. And he guides the belief that some believe that when you eat meat, that that meat somehow connects one to God. That somehow it connects one to favor with God. Paul clarified that and sorted that misunderstanding out very clearly as he stated, that's not the case. That's not what happens at all. Meat does not commend us or draw us near to God. Jesus Christ is the only one that can draw us near to God. And he recalls our minds and helps us to understand that Jesus Christ is God. And that only he can commend us to God. But I'm thankful that he is my Savior. I'm thankful that he drew me near to God. What a blessing that is. And he acknowledges the belief that there is one Savior, but he also acknowledges the belief that there are some Christians who do trust in God, who do trust in Christ, but they have been told from a small age or a young age that meat that's offered to an idol connects them to that idol. And so as they partake or as they look at this meat that is offered, to them in the marketplace maybe it's from a neighbor or a loved one that if they eat that meat that it's going to connect them to that idol and they don't want to be connected to that idol anymore they want to be connected to the one true living god and them eating that meat troubles them it offends them it brings a struggle in their heart and in their conscience and they don't want that they want to follow Christ with all of their heart and eating that meat troubles them as they do not want to be connected to that idol anymore. And Paul acknowledges that stance. Paul calls that a weaker stance. Not understanding all the principles and let me just simply state if you're growing in Christ it's okay to be growing in Christ and you'll ne we'll never fully understand all that's in the Word of God. There is no one on this planet that understands everything in the Word of God. The Word of God is God's mind, which is infinite. It is impossible for us with our human nature to be able to fully comprehend everything that is in the Word of God. So we are all growing. We're all growing together by God's grace and His love. And we need to be patient and kind with one another and help and encourage one another. And Paul was trying to relay this heart of love and this heart of understanding. And so as we speak into our text this morning, Please don't misunderstand or don't mistake this. I'm not, I'm not being negative or harsh on the weak mind, uh, on the weaker brother, nor am I trying to be critical of the stronger brother. But I'm trying to help us to see that there is a balance between these two. That we, who maybe are uh, those who are stronger uh, as Christians and are bearing fruit, that we can help and encourage the weaker brother and support them and help them to bear fruit and to grow in strength. There's a balance there, and God wants us to be balanced Christians. Paul guides the heart, Paul guides the mind. Then I want you to see in our text this morning that thirdly, God guides the actions. God guides the actions. You know, God guides our heart on how we should operate. 
And Paul helped us understand that. <laughs> Should be through charity, through love. But as we understand the motive of love, we need to understand the difficulties in which people might be struggling with. Some are still trying to understand some core doctrines. Some understand some core doctrines. And are saying, I want to go on to the next doctrine. I want to go on to the next thing. I want to learn some more in that area. I've understood that and I've grown from, I've grown in that. And so there's a balance of guiding the heart and guiding the mind. And Paul says, through that, it will guide our actions. Look at verse number 9 with me once again this morning. The Bible says, But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours. Stop there for just a moment. Paul transitions from where the weaker Christian is struggling, the weaker brother is struggling, He's trying to grasp some things. He's trying to comprehend things in his heart and in his mind. And he's still learning. He's still growing. And thank God that there are Christians who are still growing and learning. Oh, may we always have that spirit. Paul tells the stance of where they're struggling. But then he goes to that of the stronger Christian. To those who say, I understand the principle. I understand that meat doesn't connect me to an idol. I understand that it's just, it's just meat. It's just substance. It's just something in which, yea, I can partake in it. It would nourish my body or my body. And that strong believer then has come to truth with this, that meat cannot connect or disconnect us from God. And we're going to make application in just a moment. And this strong believer knows it's okay to eat meat. And then begins to take liberty to do as he pleases, no matter who is around. You see, he has the knowledge. He understands the principle of what the Word of God has to say. That meat cannot connect us to God. But now, Paul is trying to help that strong believer understand that knowledge is a good thing when taken in balance but the motive behind knowledge should still be love. The heart should still be that of wanting to help and to encourage people. And he addresses the heart of the strong believer that love is a greater way of living. That charity is a higher path to live this life on. Notice he says, but take heed. He's speaking to the strong believer. He says, notice, he says, watch carefully. That's what the word take heed means. He says to be vigilant. He says, look out. He says, be careful that what? That by any means this liberty or this freedom that you have taken becomes what? A stumbling block. A stumbling block. There is a word speaking of an obstacle against which a person might catch his foot. It is tripping. It is falling down. It is stumbling. We've all done that, haven't we? I remember as a boy, we'd be running and maybe we would catch our foot on a root of a tree or on a stone that was sticking up a little bit in the pathway. And my mom would watch as we fall down and she would make sure we're okay. And then she would always say, did you have a nice trip? Uh, did you enjoy the journey? And that was a bad mother joke. And, uh, uh, you know, the fathers get ridicule about bad father's jokes. What about bad mother jokes? That was a bad, uncaring joke. Did you enjoy a nice trip? Uh, no, I did not enjoy the trip. I fell. I hurt. That was not fun. Uh, but uh, it's a blessing. Anyway, where did I, I don't know why I went down that road. That was a rabbit trail. I probably shouldn't have gone down. My mother's going to call me this afternoon. I'll be in trouble. Please pray for me. Um, but... Uh, there's a stumbling block. There is something that trips. And Paul states, take heed, be careful that you don't become that, 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 that stumbling block. Be careful you don't become that stone that a weaker brother trips on and falls and is hurt. He says, be careful 
that you don't become a detriment to someone trying to grow by grace. You see, a man has a right to eat or drink what he wants. Paul understood this. But he also understood the struggle a new believer may have in trying to reprogram his thinking after being told for so many years that the meat he ate connected him to these false gods. You see, a man does not have the right, Paul was teaching us, or excuse me, does not have the right to encourage others by our example to do something that might be against his conscience. Paul was teaching us that it is not a right for us to do what we want, hurting others who are the weaker brother. Paul was not referring here to a deliberate tempting of a weak brother to do something that he believes is wrong, but rather carelessly setting an example that might end up being harmful to someone else. Paul's not talking about deliberately going out and trying to hurt someone. The Bible speaks of that and calls that evil. Paul's not referring to this. He's not referring to deliberately trying to afflict someone's damage in their heart and spirit. That's not what Paul is addressing. Paul's addressing a brother who is careless. That's why Paul says, take heed. Watch carefully. Watch what you're doing because people are watching and you might be in a situation or going into a situation into which the weak brother looks and interprets it in a way which causes an offense in his heart and life. Paul was trying to help these believers understand that we need to walk carefully through life because we don't want to become a stumbling block to them that are weak. Paul then illustrates this problem. So often as I went through seminary and was taking hermeneutics or hermeneutics and uh, was looking at preaching and teaching the word of God, often it would be stated, give the point and then give an illustration. Well, here's exactly what Paul does. He gives a point and then he gives an illustration. Let's look at the illustration that Paul gives us. Look at verse number 10. For if any man see thee which hast knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple. Okay, so Paul here quickly gives an illustration that everyone in Corinth would have quickly understood. Let me illustrate it and let me give it into our cultural mindset so we understand what Paul is, uh, the situation in which he is referring to. A man is invited by someone, maybe it's a net relative, a loved one, or maybe a friend that maybe he is genuinely trying to reach with the gospel. And as this individual invites him to a meal, this meal is in a temple. This meal is in a place in which people come to worship this false god. And this believer, knowing that that meat does not connect him in any way to God, agrees to go to that temple for a meal. And as he is at this meal, they would have, as he would often say, say grace, quote unquote, to this idol. Often before we are, every time before we sit down as a family and eat, we pray and we give grace or we thank God for his grace, uh, graciousness to us for giving us the food to be able to enjoy. And as you can tell, God has been very good. God has blessed and we're thankful for that. What a blessing it is to see the provision of God. And that's a right thing to do, to give honor to our true God. However, many at this time and this culture would do the same to an idol. And they would give thanks to these idols for the food. And a Christian is sitting at this meal listening to the saying of grace. This believer knowing it is just meat, justifies his position of the meal and the setting, knowing that he just simply wants to get them the gospel of Christ, knowing that he's trying to find an inroad to be able to witness to them. 
And he justifies what he is doing because of his motive, because of his stance. This would be like a man going into a movie theater. And on this movie theater, they are playing an 18-rated movie. He's going with his friend, maybe because he likewise is trying to be a friend and support and spending some time hoping that the gospel is able to be given after this movie. And as he is going into this movie that's going to have much wickedness on the screen, a new believer or a weak brother sees them walk into this theater knowing full well what's going to be on that screen. The strong believer might be able to justify his position. But that weak brother looks and says, I don't understand. I thought he said he was a true believer in Christ. If he can justify it, why can't I justify it? That's exactly what Paul is speaking of. It's the type of situation that Paul is referring to. The weak believer sees what is happening and is hurt because of what he does. You see, Paul does not approve of going to such lengths to demonstrate one's liberty. It's hinted at in the wording in which he uses in the idol's temple. The word is idolion which should have raised a warning flag in the minds of his readers. It was not a word used by the pagans, but rather a word coined by the Jews and one which contained a taunt, where the Greeks spoke of Athenium, or the Apollonium, or the Pisidium, linking the name of the temple to the name of the God. The Jews spoke of the Idolium. The very word idolion implied something shadowy and unreal. Doubtless, those believers who accepted an invitation to a banquet held in an idolium could find arguments to justify their behavior. However, Paul finds an argument to condemn it. The weak brother's conscience and the harm that might result to him if he followed such an example. One believer is trying to justify his actions, claiming his strength like these believers were claiming their strength of eating meat no matter where it came from. And yet, this, uh, this, uh, Paul was addressing the situation of one trying to justify their position and a weak brother seeing this, not understanding the strength of that position or even the misunderstanding of that position. And notice how Paul continues. Has knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple? And the Bible tells us, continues in verse number 10, shall not the weak, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to eat those things which are offered to idols. The Bible tells us the weak brother sees what's taking place. He sees him going into the idol, he's, or idol's temple. He sees him eating meat. And he becomes emboldened. That word emboldened there speaks of building up. In other words, he gets uh, strength in his eyes through this and he says well if he can do it i can do it It'd be kind of like if i were to go out to my garage this afternoon as i'm in my garage i am bench pressing 100 kilograms you say pastor 100 kilograms i could do 200 but i'll keep it at 100 i don't want to bring any impression uh or try to boast in any way uh 300 you know would be my max you know, 400 on a big day, but uh, no, let's just say 100 kilograms. And as I take that 100 kilograms, I'm bench pressing it. And my youngest boy, Samuel, comes and he sees, 
his daddy lifting these heavy weights in the garage. And as I bench pressed this, I then put it onto the holder. Uh, and as I'm putting it onto the rest there, I then slide out from that weight and then go back into, uh, into my house. And as I'm there, Samuel begins to think, Daddy could do it. Can't I? And so he gets underneath that bench press. He gets on that bench, lies down, and he begins to push with all his might to try to move that 100 kilograms. Maybe with all of his strength and with all of his might, because after all, he is his daddy's boy, very strong, he moves one end of it. And as he moves one end of it, it comes off the rest. What happens? The Bible teaches us what happens. Look at verse number 11. And through thy knowledge, and through what you thought was right, and how you justified your position, shall the weak brother perish. What happens? Disaster takes place. The weak brother becomes confused and becomes an unfruitful Christian that stops growing in his relationship with God. You see, tragedy has happened because he saw a brother justifying what he claimed was a strong position through his knowledge. And as he tried to bench or press or to lift that weight, that weight came off and he could not support it trouble happened hurt took place a perishing the bible says happens in other words this weak brother is now yea hurt yea maybe even permanently through this life because of the stance in which he tried to take through the liberty of a stronger brother the liberty that the christ that the one christian expressed has led to another child of god becoming confused dismayed discouraged and disheartened and although the exact practice of eating this meat of connecting us to god isn't prevalent in our culture today there is a principle today that is very real in this portion of scripture that is still a prevalent problem in our society today we have many believers today trying to justify a position and a practice and believers who are trying to use what they quote as Christian liberty are trying to uh, 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 try to justify their position but that position is harmful to other believers two families go to a restaurant both are celebrating special occasions one maybe is celebrating an anniversary and his husband and wife are going out to a meal and they have some friends with them. And as they go to this meal, they sit down and they think it's okay and, justif- and try to justify their position that it's okay to drink alcohol on special occasions like this. And so they're at this restaurant and they decide to order some alcohol. This couple saved. They attend church. They're involved in a ministry of the church. They've done so for years, and people around them look to them as strong Christians. And they classify their position, even though it is twisted context of Scripture, as a strong position. And they begin to uh, begin to partake of this meal and of this alcohol another family from the same church just happens to be going to the same restaurant it wasn't planned it just happened that way but this family is in a much different situation this family is coming through the heartache of a husband and a father that life has been wrecked by alcohol. 
He's been deceived by it. His family has been ravaged by this. But he has started to see the truth of the Word of God, and as he started to see the truth of the Word of God, he has decided he is not going to drink any longer. Even though he was addicted, and by the grace of God, they are coming to celebrate a couple of months of him being sober, and oh, they are excited about what is happening. God is beginning to repair the brokenness in their home, their finances that were ravaged through this man's addiction of, of, of alcoholism is becoming, uh, is getting better, and they've scraped together enough funds for this family to go and celebrate a sober father and a sober husband. This wife is beginning to warm once, up, uh, uh, warm once again to her husband as the marriage is starting to become better and is starting to become one like it. Maybe it started out, but alcohol had its effects. Their children are starting to trust their father again because they no longer have to wonder about what their father is going to do when he comes home drunk he's been sober he's been kind he's been gentle and all this family is excited they are one they're encouraged by how god is helping this man their loved one get a step or a footing from the sin of alcohol and as they're sitting at this restaurant they look across the way and see this revered christian the one who is in the ministry the one who is doing well and is growing and is doing uh, and is prospering in the church is partaking of alcohol the scene is imprinted in this man's mind he dismisses it and goes his way and doesn't think a thing about it for maybe a couple of days. But then the devil brings some temptation alongside. He says, wouldn't it be nice to taste that once again? Maybe a week goes by. Some friends at work maybe want to go and enjoy a meal together and he says i'll go with you and as he goes to this restaurant with his friends his mates they begin to order alcohol and as they begin to order one of his friends looks and says i'll pay i'm not don't worry about it i know you're i know you've been getting your footing back again your finances are getting back in order i'm going to care for this Order what you want. What do you want to drink? And he sits there for a moment and contemplates. And the devil brings by that temptation. That thought of that strong believer, or so he thought, partaking in alcohol across the restaurant last week. And he thinks to himself, if he thinks it's okay must be okay for me and so he orders maybe he doesn't partake in as much as he would before maybe he just has one and he goes home doesn't tell his wife tries to act like he has been acting the last couple of months and for his family but that thought of i handled this no one knew. I can handle it again. Weeks go by, and suddenly that brother who was tempted to partake in alcohol just one time now is in partaking of it on a daily basis to excess. Much to excess. One, by the way, is excess. And before long, their finances are again in ruins. The marriage is now falling apart once again, and 
The children now fear when their daddy is coming home, wondering if he's going to come home in a drunken stupor. What happened? Exactly what Paul stated here in verse number, uh, verse number 11, Paul stated, yea, a strong brother or a quote unquote strong brother. And by the way, I don't believe this is a fair comparison because alcohol is very much against the word of God. It is very clear, even a cursory understanding without twisting the context of scripture, that it is very clear God does not want us to partake in it. Is it in the word of God? Absolutely. But is ever in condoning way? It is not. God does not want us to partake in that. And by the way, do not become do not become beguiled by that sinful temptation it will hurt i've seen too many families destroyed by it don't partake in it god wants to redeem and to reclaim a life and to set you upon some stable footing not on a slippery slope paul stated a weak brother sees what is quote unquote a strong brother's belief and because of what he has seen it has led him down a path that has caused destruction to his home, that has caused destruction to his family, that has caused the weak brother to perish. And Paul reminds us, for whom Christ died? Paul stated he's still saved, he's still on his way to heaven, but that weak brother has been, uh, has been beguiled into a slippery slope. Why? Because he saw one believer who could justify his position and could claim that he is strong enough to handle it, led into a temptation that caused a weak brother to perish. It's exactly the context in which Paul gives us this morning. I want you to notice verse number 12 here. Notice what Scripture teaches us. As Paul gives this introduction of actions to a complaint. The complaint is this. But when ye sin, so against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, ye sin against Christ. Paul is looking squarely at the strong believer, quote unquote. And he is saying, when you cause a stumbling block, living carelessly, he says, you have sinned against this brother. You have sinned against this man. Paul lays a complaint against him that says, you have sinned against that man. The Bible tells us that Christ died for our sins, but he ought not, die for, but he ought not just die for my sins, he died for the sins of the world. And it is a sin against a brother to put a stumbling block in someone's path that leads them into a life of sin and of destruction in their life. Just because I think I'm strong enough to handle it doesn't justify that I ought to do it. Paul states that just because one thinks one is strong enough to handle what he is about to do doesn't justify that we ought to do it. Think of Peter. Right before the crucifixion, as he was going to the, as Jesus was uh, being questioned by Pontius Pilate and the Pharisees, Peter, yea, stood in that courtyard, and the Bible teaches us that Peter denied Jesus Christ. He was a stumbling block for some. Certainly, those that were around the camp, uh, that around the fire, and they heard Peter deny that Jesus Christ was his friend, deny that he knew Jesus Christ, and began to curse and to blaspheme against a holy God. Certainly, those who heard Peter do so, but then stand up, yea, a month and a half or so later, and preach Jesus Christ. I heard what he said at the garden. I heard what he said when Jesus was being crucified. Why does he think he can tell me this now? I heard what he said. It was a stumbling block, certainly for others. Certainly there are people who may very well be in hell today because Peter decided that it was okay he could justify his denial. We sin against a brother. We sin against others. And when God says we sin against others, wounding their conscience, offending their conscience, 
causing a perishing to happen. Notice what the Bible tells us. He sinned against Christ. Jesus stated this. Look at Matthew chapter 25. Notice what the Bible says in verse number 34. Then shall the king say unto them in his right, on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was an hungered, and ye gave me drink, or meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee, or thirsty and gave thee drink? When, when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? Christ is using an illustration here of feeding and giving him drink and clothes. And they're saying, when did we see these things? We didn't see these things of you, Christ. And notice what God says. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren. Notice this phrase, Ye have done it unto me. That is a powerful statement, right? Jesus said, if you do it unto another, it is like doing it unto God. If I am wounding the conscience of a weaker brother, I wound the conscience and sin against a holy God. Jesus taught us a principle here that he blesses his family that is doing right by doing right towards others. And doing right towards others is doing right towards God. Remember what the Bible teaches us in our text in verse number 6 when he says, But to us there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. Paul stated, remember that we're in Christ. Remember that we're in him. When I get saved, I'm in the family of God, and those who put their trust in Christ are in the family of God. If I hurt one of God's family, I hurt God. We have an incredible church here. Just an amazing what God has done. We have a church that's very loving, very welcoming. And oh, how wonderful it is to see some dear saints love on my children, love on my boys. They'll give gifts, they'll give different kind gestures and just take wonderful care of them they're doing it unto my children but when they're doing it unto my children oh how wonderful it is that they also do it unto me they might be giving to one of my boys but they're being a blessing and a help to me what an encouraging thing it is that as people give, yes, they're giving to my sons, but they are doing so and they are being a blessing and help to me. Such is the way with the family of the family of God. As we do right to another brother or to another child of God, God states, it's like you're doing it to me. We need to remember that. We need to be reminded of that. Paul plays or reminds us of the complaint that we need to be careful that we're not wounding the conscience of the weaker brother. But then he lays here the conviction. Look at verse number 13 and we're done. Wherefore, if meat make my brother to offend, 
Paul had a conviction. He lays the complaint and now he gives us his conviction. The conviction is, is this, that if someone was going to be offended by him eating meat, he would rather go hungry than to offend. That word offend there is a causing of stumble or a snare. Paul is stating, I understand what's taking place. I understand the position. I understand what God tells me, and I understand this. But if there's one who doesn't fully understand this, if one doesn't fully understand what God's, uh, God understands, and this is a struggle for him, he said, I will not eat meat. He said, I won't eat that meat at the market. I won't eat that meat that was offered to an idol. Why? Because I don't want to offend. I don't want to cause a snare. I don't want to cause another Christian to stumble. Notice he says, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth. Not only does he use the word meat like as in the meat that was offered to market, but he even goes to another stance saying, I will eat no flesh. He was saying all meat that even could be considered part of an idol or something that could be misconstrued <coughs> as part of the idol. He says, I would rather starve i would rather go hungry than to offend someone and cause a stumbling block in their heart and life paul's conviction was to operate in such a way that love was shown a love of a neighbor was shown a charity was given that was willing to act upon that love in his heart and that understanding of scripture he understood that it was okay to eat the meat, but he said, I'm not going to eat the meat if it's going to cause someone to stumble, if it's going to cause someone to offend, if it's going to bring a situation in one's heart where they become a casualty. I'm not going to go that direction. Paul's conviction given to us through the Holy Spirit of God was it's rather better not to offend and to cause someone to stumble. Sometimes we as Christians look for an excuse of why we should do something. And it doesn't matter what others think because I understand the position in which I am. I understand what the Bible tells us and I'm going to hold that position no matter what. I'm going to do what I think I have Christian liberty to do because after all, I am firmly rooted in this and I don't, it doesn't matter who is watching. And God says, be careful of that. That is a stance that can cause someone to stumble. But then, often, a strong believer will give an excuse. You mean I can't do this just because of a weaker brother? Let me ask you what's more important the family of God or our desire for just a few moments. But likewise, younger or weaker Christians, may I remind you that this is not a reason to bring up before others and state, you can't do that because you know what I think about that. You know my stance and I don't agree with that and therefore you can't do it either. Because you know what I think about that. You know what I understand about that. And I, you can't do that. In essence, hold a Christian hostage because of their stance. The Bible speaks against that as well. In Romans chapter 15, verse number 2, the Bible tells a religious, uh, excuse me, let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. We ought to be preferring one another. And the Bible tells us we ought to want to grow. And it is not right for a weaker brother to become a re religious bigot, a, 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 a religious bigot who uses their inhibitions just to get their way uh, for what is wrong or for what they think is wrong. It is wrong for a weaker brother to say, you can't do that because you know where I stand. That likewise is wrong. 
That's, that's hindering the growth of other Christians. And that is a wrong thing. A weaker Christian, one who is trying to understand a Christian. And by the way, there is no shame in being a Christian who is growing and learning some things. That is a good thing. We all had to start at, at ground zero. We all had to start with a blank slate in essence. And some of us have had the world write much on that slate, much on that whiteboard. And some of it needs to be erased off. And as we come to understand, we need to be continually growing and not come to a point in which we state, okay, it's going to be okay and I'm not going to go any further. There's a balance here. The balance is, let's trust in Christ. It is just as wrong for one to offend the weaker brother and it is just as wrong for the weaker brother to use their weakness as a weapon to get what they want. We should be growing in the Lord and our point of growth in the Lord should not inhibit another's walk with the Lord. The Bible teaches us <coughs> that we ought to grow together as Christians. And oh, how wonderful it is that we can get to grow together as Christians. My wife and I have a couple of different thinkings or likes and desires. One of which is that of a roller coaster. I don't like roller coasters. <laughs> not at all. <laughs> I am not one that likes to go on them in any way. I would much rather stay on the ground and not go on one. Now, I love airplanes. I love flying. And they can twist and they can turn. They can do whatever they want. And I'm as happy as can be. But when it comes to a roller coaster, it's not me. My wife likes to go on a roller coaster. My wife likes to ride on those. And I'm glad she does. I'm glad she enjoys that time. But it would be wrong for me to use my stance of not liking to be on a roller coaster as an excuse for her never to ride one. She's gone with family. She's gone with friends. She's had an opportunity. Our boys have sometimes have gone along as well. And I'll stay on the ground where I'm safe, but my wife gets to go, and I'm glad she does. I'm not going to use my stands as a reason for why she cannot go forward. And you know, that's exactly what the Bible is speaking of and teaching into. It is a Christian who is trying to justify and say, you can't do that because of where I stand. God says that's not what this is about. We ought to be loving one another, preferring one another. And I'm thankful that we can prefer one another through the balance of 1 Corinthians 8. The balance, as we look at eating meat, the balance is the principle of, am I going to hurt someone? If someone saw me doing what I want and justify to do, is this going to hurt someone else? And if it does, if it does, then I ought not to do it. Thank God for the balance He gives in the Word of God. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you so much for how you have worked and guided in our hearts and minds. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for being good to us. I pray that if there's someone here that does not know Christ, someone listening this morning that does not know Christ, I pray they too will come to know Christ as Savior. And God, I pray that those Christians who maybe... I want to try to justify some positions this morning. Would help and understand the balance of looking at what the Word of God has to say. Help us, I pray, to follow your Word. Strengthen us, I pray. In Jesus' blessed name, amen. Wonderful. Thank you so much for joining. I apologize for the video going out. And uh, thank you so much for staying and listening for just a few moments. I appreciate that very much. 
uh, will continue improving. Thank you for being patient as we work patient as we work out all the kinks uh, of our system. And if we can help or serve in any way, please feel free to contact us. Let us know. Uh, send us a message. We'd be happy, of course, to help in any way that we can. And uh, thank you so much for your patience there. And uh, it's encouraging. Uh, it's growing, and uh, we'll become proficient in this in the weeks to come. Thank you so much for help being patient as we implement some systems here. Wonderful. A couple quick things that I wanted to remind us of. First of all, uh, I can remind you uh, to subscribe to our YouTube channel. That would be a wonderful blessing. Uh, we'll post the link down below this video. And if you could help us with that and subscribe to that, that would be a great, great help as we uh, want to, we're trying to get 100 subscribers so we can have a customized channel uh, that we can use effectively to, of course, uh, get more people the gospel of Jesus Christ and to be able to go live there. If you could help us with that, if you could share that, that would be a blessing. I, saw, I know some have. Thank you for that. If I can encourage you to continue to do so, that would be a help and a blessing. Also, uh, on this afternoon, uh, actually it should, have, should be live right now, there is an out, online outreach tool that we have worked on. And I'm excited about this. This is going to be a wonderful tool that I think God can use in a wonderful way to help us get the gospel. Throughout this time, we've been working and thinking about how can we help others to get the gospel. And we've been, of course, trying to do through, through the live stream services, and those have been a help and a blessing. We want to use, utilize a tool. Uh, we used it some before e the Easter services on an advert that we put together called There Is Hope. We have customized a page with that even further. And if you were to go to our website, you'll see a link to There Is Hope there on that web page. And on that is the plan of the, the plan of uh, the plan of a uh, plan of salvation. There's a message on there that speaks into that very thought of hope and finding that hope in Jesus Christ from the Easter message that was preached. And then along with that is the plan of salvation, as well as an area where people can respond to that and let us know that they have put their faith and trust in Christ. And I encourage you to please utilize that tool. I believe it'll be a help. We're going to give links. It'll be an opportunity to get others the gospel. There'll be a QR code. Uh, maybe you're uh, out shopping and you can just hold up a QR code to give people an opportunity to respond to that. I encourage you to do so. Uh, and I hope it'll be a tool that you can share. You could share the web page. You could share this to others and help people see their need of Jesus Christ. Uh, we are going to be putting in some advertising over the next month in this very thing. And so it'll be something that by the grace of God, uh, we'll go through our area and yay around the world to reach people with the gospel of Christ. We want to help. We we're trying to think of some ideas in which we can help reach people right now with the gospel of Christ. And I pray that this will be a way in which we can do so. So I encourage you uh, to watch uh, members, the our email, uh, your email, that will be coming through uh, yay very soon. And you will have an opportunity to begin sharing that. And I pray that you'll do so. And that will be a help and encouragement to others. Thank you so much for that. Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, we'll look forward to being back live streaming here as well. And then, of course, Saturday, uh, we will have a prayer meeting uh, at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Thank you so much for watching this morning. Again, I apologize about a few glitches here this morning. Uh, one was not on our end, and uh, the other one, I don't know what took place here. We'll figure it out, and we'll get it sorted by Wednesday. Thank you for being patient, and uh, it's a blessing for sure. All these wonderful uh, uh, systems, and I've always heard the devil is in the sound system, and I think that could be true. Uh, <laughs> it's just incredible, but it's a blessing. We're getting, we're getting it figured out. We're getting better, and we're, we'll make more steps, and I appreciate your patience there. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask the Lord to bless as we close. Father, thank you for the day. Thank you for this time. Bless it, I pray. Bless as we enjoy the time with our families today. Uh, encourage, God, if there's one that's listening that does not know Christ, I pray they'll reach out to us and help us to uh, show them what the Bible says, how they can know for sure they have a home in heaven. And God, I do pray that you would be with uh, each one as children of God. Help us, I pray, uh, to act 
and to operate in charity. And God, we know that you bless that. Encourage, I pray, our hearts this morning through Scripture. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us today.